everybody. We are going to get started. Um, I want to say hello and welcome to all to Lunch with the Needles. My name is Amy Tomino and I am an associate professor and librarian at JJC. I want to thank you all for spending your lunch with us. We will begin with a talk and discussion with our three presenters, followed by a Q&A, and finally a listening party and open mic. I'd like to introduce our presenters. John Lyons is a professor of history in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, where he teaches classes in British and US history. He is the author of the book, Joy and Fear, The Beatles of Chicago in the 1960s. <laughs> there it is. We have a copy in the library. Well. Every home should have a copy. Exactly. <laughs> okay. paid for. Exactly. Jim Baskin is a professor of English at JJC, where he teaches classes in composition and literature. For the past several years, his English 102 course has included a research paper assignment on the Beatles. Bill O'Connor serves as chair of the JJC Business Department and has taught business law here since 1999. He started with his colleague, Jim. Those who have taken Bill's classes may recall his use of the Beatles to help teach legal principles with lawsuits between John and Paul or George and Ringo or other parties from Sgt. Pepper to Yoko Ono and Lucy in the Sky. It is also rumored that he was one of the first ten Beatles fans in Illinois. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Professor Lyons. Hello everybody, it's so great to see a big crowd here. It's just amazing what free food and extra credit does. <laughs> Good to see you all here. But, uh, okay, now as I look around this room, am I supposed to talk to you? As I look around this room, I can obviously see that most of you are far too young to remember the Beatles. And uh, it's probably your grandparents. Probably ask your grandparents about them. They'll tell you who they were. But uh, So what I'm going to do today is uh, just give a little bit of an overview about who were the Beatles and why they're important. That's it, really. And I always say about the Beatles, you know, even if you don't like their music, you know, you can still say that they do have an importance in uh, American and world history. And uh, I know Jim and Bill are going to tell you about their favourite songs, etc. But I'm just going to give you a little overview about who were the Beatles, okay? So, off we go. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Just quickly about the origins, where they were from. Then, uh, again, a little bit about Beatlemania in the UK and then in the US. And then finally, about what was their impact on uh, pretty much world history. Or, uh, yeah, world history. Okay, so they came from a place in uh, England, which is called Liverpool. And Liverpool, you can see it on the map there, is in the northwest of England. It's a port city, and uh, that's where the Beatles came from. And in terms of who were the Beatles, the, uh, the, the founder, really, of the group was John Lennon. Okay? And again, as I tell my uh, History 106, there was no relation to Vladimir. But uh, anyway, so uh, John Lennon, and he, when he was a teenager, he was born in 1940. They were all born during World War II. Uh, he started a group called the, the Quarrymen, and you can see him here in the picture. And uh, he um, uh, played rhythm guitar in uh, the Beatles. The second person joined uh, the Quarrymen in 1957, and that is Paul McCartney. And uh, he went on to play uh, bass guitar in the group. And Lennon and McCartney wrote most of their songs. Not all of them, but they did write most of them. They were the major songwriters in the group. Now, they, they look so young in this picture, and that's because they are so young. And uh, this is uh, George Harrison. He joined in uh, early 1958, and he was uh, the youngest member of the group. So if you think about it, he would have been only about 15 when he joined uh, the Quarrymen. And this is the first uh, uh, picture we have of the three of them together. So you can see Paul, uh, John, and then uh, George. Okay? And that was the nucleus of the band. They changed their name to uh, the Beatles in 1960, and they had various uh, other members of the group. The most prominent uh, one was the drummer, and his name was Pete Best. 
and he lasted for two years, from 1960 to 1962, and he was finally replaced by Ringo Starr. And so when Ringo Starr joined the group, that meant that was the iconic four members, which was uh, John, Paul, George, and then uh, Ringo. Okay? And again, this is the first picture we have of them all together. And they're, uh, they're practicing in uh, a place they used to play in Liverpool called The Cavern. Do you want to hear them playing in The Cavern? Yeah. Not sure. I don't know what I would have done if you'd said no. <laughs> now this has been colorized. released in October 62 and that was called Love Me Do, which is this one here, and then uh, their first breakthrough hit in the UK was in early 1963 and that was with Please Please Me. So early 1963 was their first number one hit and it was their second record that was released. Uh, again, I, I, I was going to explain to this crowd what a single is, but I'm looking around, you know what, I just don't think I'll bother. Just like a but, uh, anyway, so, and then what happens, over the length of 1963, they become more and more popular, and by the end of the year, they're pretty much a phenomenon in uh, the UK, and they were garnering headlines like this. This is from uh, a newspaper in uh, England, November 1963, and you can see the iconic headline, Beatlemania. Yeah. And uh, it says there, it's happening everywhere, even in sedate Cheltenham. And what that means is, uh, the American version would be, it's happening everywhere, even in sedate New Lenox. <laughs> so that's the, uh, now this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, and uh, this again is, uh, and this is actually my uh, honors class when I walk in the classroom. But, uh, <laughs> Okay, so basically by the end of 63, they were a phenomena in the UK, okay? Now, how did they get on in the US? And their first record that was released in the US was released on a Chicago-based record label owned by an uh, African-American couple, and it was called VJ Records. And the first uh, song that was released was this one here called Please Please Me, February 1963. Okay, so February 1963 is their first record release. They then released another couple of singles after that, and none of them were a hit. They, they barely sold about five or 6,000 uh, copies. So the breakthrough single was this one here. And this was released in December 63, 
It is recorded exactly 60 years ago today. And you all thought it was a coincidence that we picked this date for this. Uh, no, it wasn't. We planned this, didn't we? Years in advance, Jim. <laughs> But anyway, it was called uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and that was their first breakthrough uh, single. And uh, then they uh, first came to America in February 64. They appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was a very popular uh, show that was on Sunday evenings in uh, the US. And this is a picture from the show. And there was so much hype about them coming that when they appeared on the show, they actually uh, got a record TV audience for the time. That's kind of hard to believe, but that's because there was so much hype about them that everybody wanted to see them. And this is what it would have been like if you were in front of your TV in February 9th, 1964. There you go. Somebody said, is that you? No, it isn't. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, that's, uh, now, so they became again more and more popular. And this is always something that uh, people talk about now because... Uh, for years, we used to always say the only band that had five singles in the top uh, te uh, five records on, on Billboard, and uh, this was in April '64. So these were the top five singles. So one to five was all. And up until recently, you'd say Beatles were the only one. But I'm sure now Drake and uh, Taylor Swift were down and down. Taylor Swift probably had the top hundred. So, but, uh, anyway, so that's. Uh, they went on to record uh, a number of albums. This is the ones they recorded in the UK. And I'm showing this because there was different albums released in the US. Okay, so these are the UK albums. And I think, again, what's uh, kind of unique about the Beatles is when they had a hit formula, a hit record, they didn't just basically repeat the formula. They then tried something else. And so if you are interested in any of their records, you can see that there is progression. Each record does sound different to the other. So, you know, they're all uh, worth uh, uh, purchasing, obviously. Now, the bad news is, in uh, April 1970, Paul quits. And that's the end of the Beatles. April 1970. So if you think about it, their first records released in the UK in October 62, they broke up in 70. That means eight years. Less than eight years, seven, seven years really, seven and a half years, that's all they recorded. And they, uh, they basically made uh, uh, albums, singles, films, TV shows, radio shows. You know, it's an amazing uh, output they have. So anyway, the, uh, I know again what you all want to know is, uh, what's the connections to Joliet? And believe it or not, there is two Beatles connections to Joliet. The first one is, Joliet is mentioned in a song by an ex-Beatle. I can see the shock in your face. <laughs> Pete Best. Who? He was the drummer before Ringo Starr, if you remember. Okay? And he brought out this record. And what wants to do is... If you listen to it, after he mentions Chicago, there's a gap. Then he mentions Joey Ed. Mission alone, wasn't it? Okay, and now, as my students that went to the um, uh, historical site with me uh, last week know, we also had a beetle that set foot in Joliet. Yes, and that beetle was Paul McCartney, he was then with his girlfriend, and he was uh, he set off from Chicago and he was doing Route 66. And he's the one of the, well, the first stop was in uh, the Joliet Historical Museum. And uh, the woman that was there approached them and said, you've got to move your car. And then uh, after that, she uh, got an autograph. And there's the autograph there. So there you are. But, uh, so that's the two connections. The Beatles in Joliet. Okay, the last point is, uh, so what was their impact? Okay, and I'll, again, I'll do this very briefly. I don't want to take up too much more time. But in terms of their impact musically, okay, I think these are the three things I'd say musically. First of all, before the Beatles, people used to basically have songwriters, they used to have musicians, and then they used to have pretty boys and girls that would appear on stage. Okay, and they're often different things. 
after the Beatles, you have people now that record their own songs, play on them, and also tour them. And that was pretty unique. I know today you probably, uh, I think things have gone back a little bit to uh, uh, having songwriters uh, write the, the songs. But before the Beatles, that was common, and the Beatles broke that. And if you look at people from the 60s and 70s, most of them recorded their own songs and uh, wrote their own songs as well. Uh, the second one is, if you think about the, before the Beatles, virtually all the major pop stars were solo acts. You think about it. Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, Elvis Presley, in England, Cliff Richard. And then even if there's a group, it's usually Buddy Holly and the Crickets. In other words, there's still a name in the front. The Beatles were one of the first, I wouldn't say the first, but one of the first to actually have a collective band identity. And it comes with the name, the, the, the Beatles, there's no John Lennon and the Beatles, and also they all sang on their own records, on the records. So each one of them also sang, and also there is a collective identity. If you look at the four of them, they, they had the same haircuts, the same uh, clothing, and so that was all done purposely to, to say that we're a band, it's not one person at the front, and I think that was unique as well for the time. And then the last one is, uh, there's no doubt about it, their music does change, and they start to incorporate different sounds into pop music. And in the early 60s, most people would have said pop music was just kind of two-minute, silly kind of music that no, would never have any longevity. But after the Beatles, of course, you still were playing that music 60 years later. And uh, one of the reasons is because they just they make it much more sophisticated and they add on all of these influences from uh, different parts of the world, different types of music, different effects, etc., etc. So that's their musical influence. There's no doubt about it also that uh, when the Beatles started, a lot of young people saw the Beatles, especially on the Ed Sullivan show, and they said, I can do that. And so what they did is they went out and they bought musical instruments. They, some of them set up groups and some of them became famous. Some of them just played in garages or whatever, but they, they basically were inspired by the Beatles. And I know this is too much writing. If I did this in my class, I'd probably get uh, shown out of the room and quit this much right. But basically, what it's saying to you is that if you look at, in 1963, Americans bought 700,000 guitars. So that's before the Beatles came. In 64, it went up to 1.1 million. And then in 65, one and a half million. So in other words, doubled the number. And uh, I don't want to read this. Or should I read this? I'll read this. Have I got a minute to read this? Uh, this is 1966, this is from Billboard magazine, okay? And they talk about how much money was spent on musical instruments, in America this is, okay? And it says, this surpassed the dollar volume for record sales, it was greater than the combined dollar volumes of all spectator sports, still and movie cameras, comic books and playing cards, instruments also outsold the entire hobby industry. That is definitely a wow. Mm -hmm. The only thing I could think of equivalent today is iPhones. Jim? Okay, anyway, so let's move on. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that they inspire people to make music. I think that's what it's all about. Okay, the next one is, and I, I like this picture because uh, there's no doubt about it, when the Beatles especially came to America, it was very unusual for boys to have long hair. Mm -hmm. a matter of fact, it was virtually un unknown, okay? And uh, after the Beatles, people, uh, boys started to grow their hair, uh, but especially in the 70s, I think people exaggerate their immediate impact. And the reason for that is because schools at the time used to have um, uh, rules about uh, boys' hair. And so therefore they had to get their hair cut. And so what you usually had is a situation like this, where you'd have groups would have the long hair, copying the Beatles. This is a group from Indiana. And then the audience would still have the short hair. And this doesn't change really until about the late 60s, where you start to see uh, uh, the, the audience also. But that was definitely the influence of the, of, uh, the Beatles. Now the other influence is that uh, the vast majority of their audience was teenage girls, okay? That was the, the, the real sort of core of their audience. And they used to buy these teen magazines to find out about uh, the Beatles. Today, you can look up TikTok. But in those days, you had to go out and buy Teen Life or whatever. And what they were looking at in the teen magazines is what the Beatles' girlfriends and wives were wearing. And what they did then, they started to copy them. And so therefore, the Beatles' influence on fashion was from then, it's obviously what boys would wear, but also it was the girls, and that was uh, uh, came from their wives and girlfriends, and that's the four of them there 
And they also used to even have uh, uh, columns in teen magazines. This is uh, Jane Asher was the uh, uh, the girlfriend of Paul McCartney, and then uh, Patty Boyd uh, was the uh, the wife of George Harrison. Uh, that's the wife of John Lennon, Cynthia. And then that is uh, Maureen Cox, who was the wife of uh, Ringo Starr. So they were also highly influential on uh, what uh, people would wear. Now, I think, again, they, the thing about the Beatles is that uh, as people got to know them more and as they grew in confidence, it was very obvious that they had a lot of things to say about the world around them. And uh, again, pretty much this is one of the first that I can think about pop stars that used to comment on the world around them. You know? And one of the things they commented on, especially when they came to America, is about racial segregation. They were actually shocked about the, the, the amount of segregation that they saw in America. And so therefore, they, uh, they refused to play in front of segregated audiences. They also made sure that every time they toured that they had black artists on the uh, uh, support acts. And you can see some of them here. There was other ones as well. But uh, they made a point of basically talking about racial segregation. And if you think about it, I can't think of any artist before then that did that in, in America. Okay, Maybe Frank Sinatra, to be fair. He did, didn't he? He was a bit of a civil rights uh, activist uh, on the slide. But not, not many others, anyway. The other thing that they became interested in was the East, Indian philosophy. And uh, George Harrison became a uh, Hindu. The rest of them uh, were certainly influenced by Hinduism and other uh, Indian ph philosophical ideas. They went to India, and uh, you, I don't know if you can even pick them out there. They look so different. There's Lenin in the corner there, there's Harrison, there's McCartney, and there's Ringo over there. And what they did is, uh, they uh, adopted a lot of Hindu beliefs, but also uh, they adopted transcendental meditation. And they also did another very strange thing, which was called yoga. And if, you, if any of you today practice meditation or yoga, you know, it was basically the Beatles that popularized both of them. You know, that was the reason why people knew about yoga and transcendental meditation is because of them. And so that's the influence they had. They also became interested in uh, uh, what was happening in the world. And in, in Britain, there was uh, uh, colonial wars that were going on in places like Biafra that they mentioned. In America, it was pretty obviously the Vietnam War. And so they started to talk a lot about peace. And this was, again, you know, this was John Lennon and his new wife, Yoko Ono. And they uh, did this peace campaign where they had a bed in for peace which uh, I think a lot of my students uh, do that uh, as well. They, they, before. They don't show up to my class. But anyway, so uh, this is basically uh, the bedding that they had. And again, it sounds weird, and it kind of was, but the point of it is, can you imagine another pop star doing this? Even today, you know, would Taylor Swift have a sit-in or bed-in? With, uh, what's the name of that rugby player she's playing with? That uh, football. football. What's, he, what's he called? Uh, Kelton, uh, the title of Kelton. Travis Kelton. Does he know there's going to be songs written about him in a few years? <laughs> <laughs> he does? He's going to leave him, but yeah. <laughs> okay, and then uh, what is the Beatles' overall message? And I think their overall message was summed up very nicely by John Lennon when he was interviewed just before his death. And this is what he said. The Beatles, or the 60s, had a message. It was learn to swim. And once you learn to swim, swim. <laughs> Subtle hint there. I'm always worried I'm not going to get applause, so I'll bring my own with me. But anyway, so thanks very much, and now it's back to, uh, to Amy. Thank you, Thank you so Amy. Welcome. 
And uh, I think following Professor Lyons makes me feel a little bit like the, the act that followed the Beatles when they were on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> so I'll try to do my best to entertain you as he did. Well, I thought it was a compliment on the Ed Sullivan show. Oh, okay, I'll tell Because if you watch the Ed Sullivan show, um, the, when, when the Beatles first made their name in America on February 9th, 1964, they were you know, virtually unknown, and it was like a, a tidal wave, as John described. And um, I, I felt so sorry for the, the jugglers and the magicians and the other uh, comic, uh, stand up comics and things that followed them because it was a tough act to follow. Them. But let me begin also by saying that I, I have a confession to make. Um, I was not always a Beatles fan. And in fact, the Beatles, the, the whole phenomenon known as Beatle mania, basically was over by the time I was two years old. I was born in the late 60s, and by 1970, as John said, they had broken up. So I was kind of late to the party. And instead, I, I was reflecting back on you know, where did my interest in them really begin. And I think it was the, the, uh, the seeds of my interest in the Beatles were planted by an imitation group, you might say, called the Monkees. That's where I'm in the 70s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, some, of you, some of you remember the Monkees. They're still, uh, well, they're not really touring now because they're mostly deceased, but the records are still available and they're really not half bad. Um, the interesting thing about the Monkees is they were an attempt by uh, movie producers, or I'm sorry, music producers, to sort of um, capitalize and cash in on the Beatles phenomena. Okay. It was an American group, although there's one, one British um, performer, David Jones, he was like a token British guy, to sort of emulate the, the Beatles. And they, but they were a lot like the Beatles, a little bit like the Beach Boys. Uh, they lived in a beach house. And, um, and uh, as a comedy show, I mean, they were really both. They were entertainers or musicians as well as um, a, a sitcom. And they had this uh, like beach house in California, and they'd have various uh, misadventures, uh, very harmless stuff. And as a young child, I, I watched them in reruns. I wasn't there for the original run, because that was coincided with Beatlemania. And um, you know, I didn't really think anything outside of it. I didn't think of the larger context. I just enjoyed them for a, a funny show. They were zany, nutty, uh, harmless, fun. And the music wasn't that bad either. And the interesting thing, there are many interesting things about them, actually. I'll, I'll get to the Beatles soon, but I'm playing the, uh, the scene here. The, um, the monkeys were not allowed to perform their own music originally. They were just hired for, for their appearance and for their c comedic talent. But then they kind of rebelled, which was common in the 60s. It was a, a time of youthful rebellion. And they asserted themselves, and they actually were musicians. I mean, they knew how to play, and they eventually, I don't know, either supersede their contract or ignore their contract or something, but they actually produced a lot of good records. But they came to the end, or they came to an end around the same time as the Beatles, you know, the late 60s. Um, and then I got to think further, uh, it still took another really 20 years for me to get into the Beatles until I was about 23 when I was down to college. Um, so in between the Monkees and the Beatles, I think there were, there were things like the Fantastic Four, I'm a, I'm a big Marvel comic fan. And then on TV there's the A-Team growing up in the 1980s with George Parr and Mr. T, they were soldiers of fortune. So there seemed to be something in my, my psychology where having four guys banding together, or in the case of Fantastic Four, three guys and, and, and a woman, but something about the number four just seemed to sort of resonate with me. It seems like a good balance of personalities, and each person has their own skill set. And I even got um, thinking a little more deeply about it. It's a little bit like the, the four elements, you know, uh, earth, air, fire, and water. And if you really play this out, I think it could apply to the Beatles. And I don't know if this has been done before. I, I've read a lot about them through the years, including John's book, and this might have been somewhere, you know, I don't want to plagiarize. I don't know if I read this somewhere. But um, just this morning I was thinking about it. I would say that John would be, if you follow this analogy, John is fire. He was passionate and easily changeable in his uh, you know, beliefs and his attitude, and he sometimes was mean to his girlfriend. So fire, that sees the passion of one of the band. Uh, the water would be John, because John and Paul were in many ways opposites, and they, but they balance each other out. Also, water has sort of a soothing quality, and, and I think Paul's voice uh, has that, that quality as well. He's very. Uh, comforting. He has, a, 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 I think, the largest range, or uh, yeah, biggest range of, of um, musical vocalization <coughs> of the band. Then they would leave uh, George Harrison, the more spiritual Beatle, as air, because air and spirituality somehow seem to be the same to me. That you you believe in a higher power, perhaps, and that's in the air. You don't necessarily see it, but you, you feel it's out there, like the air. And then, of course, we we'll leave Ringo as as the earth, uh, the earth element, because he's. Kind of dull, <laughs> but, but dependable. He's solid. He provides a foundation with his, his drumming. You know, they, they would not be the band they were without his input. And it, that's literally true because they, they had attempted to succeed and, and get gigs. And they got gigs. You know, they were playing in dive bars and things like that. But they didn't get a recording contract, really, until Ringo was there. And he was the missing ingredient that really 
sort of brought them all together. And too bad for Pete Best, who uh, was not the best sister now, but um, Ringo replaced him. So Ringo was that, that, that thing that locked them in place. Um, all right, so I think I've established that I was not shaped by the Beatles growing up. Um, I really discovered them sort of by accident on Sunday mornings. There was a, a program on the radio called Breakfast with the Beatles. I think it was on WXRT. I didn't know anyone still listened to the radio. But, but, so, yeah, so it, back then it was pretty common. And um, I, I just got you know, hooked like so many other people. But um, I couldn't say they were in part of my formative years. They were more part of my adult years. And I think what appealed to me initially, of course, was the music. And that's, they're, they're musicians, so the actual sound they produce is, is enticing and, and alluring and, and seductive. And then once you hear a Beatles song or a couple of Beatles songs, they, they, they stay with you. They, they, they have millions of fans to this day. But I think being an English major in college and an English teacher here, I think what sort of kept me interested in them to the exclusion of other groups is, is their lyrical ability, you know, the way, their way with words. So I want to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, another part of being an English major is thinking about Shakespeare all the time. And I mean, not all the time, but, but a fair amount of the time. Right? I haven't taught Shakespeare for a couple of years, but um, he's just part of being an English major. Yeah, he's part of our culture, I would argue. And that actually is kind of the point I want to make about the Beatles as well. Uh, obviously, Shakespeare and the Beatles are both British, uh, two of the best and most famous and most influential British exports that we've ever produced. But um, it's more than that. I think the, the comparison between Shakespeare and the Beatles is kind of a world view. Shakespeare as an individual artist and the Beatles as, as a group had this view of the world that they were able to um, you know, express in many different forms through entertainment. And they had a way of making you think while being entertained. And of course, they never preached. You know, that's, that's, that's too moralistic, and people don't go for that anymore. You know, people want to be able to think for themselves, but the Beatles were able to motivate that, much like Shakespeare did. Um, I think another commonality is that uh, Shakespeare and the Beatles both address things that are, are part of human nature. There's a, there's a Yale professor of English named Harold Bloom, and he talks about, or he actually wrote a book called Shakespeare, Invention of the Human, where he said that, you know, obviously human beings existed before Shakespeare, and Shakespeare was a human being. Um, but we didn't really have the same modern conception of what it means to be a human being in, a, in the modern civilized way until Shakespeare came around. And so I think Bloom's kind of controversial, and, and, and if not crazy in some of his uh, ideas, but I think that one has, has a lot of validity to it. Um, to elaborate on, on that, I, I think that what Bloom would identify with Shakespeare and what I would extend to the Beatles as well is this idea of um, all human beings are united by fear, hope, uh, desire, um, change. Um, some people fear change, some people embrace change. Uh, the Beatles are more in, in the area of embracing change, and it's what the society kind of needed at the time. Um, because of that, oh, and, and so I noticed here another uh, detail was introspection. I'm not sure that word even exists in Shakespeare's day, but it does apply to his characters, like when Hamlet says famously, to be or not to be, he's wondering about whether he should you know, kill himself or not, but really the question there is, what is the meaning of life? And, 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 and the whole play is kind of you know, a deep dive into the meaning of life. So in somewhat less intellectual ways, I think the Beatles pursue the same pursuits. Well, that's redundant. They pursue the same interests. Uh, what I find in my classes is I'm able to talk about things that relate to philosophy, Politics, art, uh, religion, sex, love, spirituality. These are things that Shakespeare is interested in and, and the Beatles as well. So I'm not going to continue this comparison that much more, but um, I think that as an English major, you just see the world a certain way, much like a, a business major sees the world a certain way and a history major as well. So um, let me talk a little bit more about their, their writing ability. Uh, they produce something like around 206 songs of their own, and they cover a lot of other uh, artists as well. You know, that's how new artists begin, apparently, is by covering old artists. So they, they emulated Chuck Berry and Elvis and Little Richard, um, Buddy Holly. Um, but it, as John said, they, they evolved. They never were really sitting still. They, they started by copying the old rock and roll of the 1950s, but they moved uh, far beyond that. They really had, I, I would say, four eras. Uh, the mop top era, as, as the media called it, where they were kind of lovable. With the, the, the hair, the hair looked like a mop, or like someone put a bowl around them, cut around the bowl. Kind of like Mo Howard, look from the Three Stooges as well. So, um, and at first they were known really just for the hair and, and less for the musical ability. But the, even in those early songs, there's a lot of um, richness, and they're not all the same. There's some variety. I would say those early songs have more in common with each other than with the later eras. But even in that first stage, there's uh, a lot of variety. 
And then uh, the, what I call the introspective era is the second phase, where they got into more examining the, uh, you know, their purpose on this planet and what's, what, I guess, not to be too highfalutin about it, but the purpose of life. Uh, then, they, the, then the drugs really got in, into, into the system in a heavy way, the psychedelic era with Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. And there it was still a, a questioning on their part of why are we here and what are we supposed to accomplish, but, but drugs were kind of the vehicle for that. The drugs really drove their, their daily life and their music, and they even they played while on drugs, they wrote about drugs. You know, a song like Losing the Sky of Diamonds is basically like a drug trip. And then finally all good things must come to an end, and you have what I call the, the dissolution era, where things are dissolving. And as Professor Lyons pointed out, by, 19, by April 1970, it was all over. Um, and I think the, the songs in that period are, are more mature. It's reflecting their, their, their growing interests, but also their separating interests. They were growing in different directions. By then, they were all married and had, had their own children. Um, and they just had other things that they wanted to do. So they didn't always perform together. And I think the, the, the lack of unity is, you know, is, I find less appealing because they were such a good core. I mean, you know, four people working as one, and some that's lost in, in the end. But nonetheless, uh, some of their best songs are really around every row of their the final album. Yeah. So again, speaking as an English major, an English teacher, and, and looking at the words, it's interesting to me that you know, how they proceeded, what the creative process was. And I've never quite made the connection in my own classes where I teach writing, you know, English 101 and English 102, but it's always in the back of my mind, like, how can I turn my students into rock stars with their writing? And, <laughs> and um, I don't know, I, I haven't quite discovered that, that secret formula yet. But uh, one thing I pointed out is that, that John, and actually this is from a textbook I, I used by Stephen Stark, um, he pointed out that John always started with the lyrics, because John kind of fancied himself a poet, and he actually wrote some books of poetry, very surreal poetry. And he would find music later that would accompany those ideas. And then Paul was the opposite. He would start with the music and then later find some words that would coincide. And um, one famous example was in the, in the great song Yesterday, by, mainly written by Paul McCartney. He's, he, he, he stuck some words in there as a placeholder. He had this melody in his head, and he wasn't even sure whether he had dreamed it up or copied it from someone. So he kind of played around with it for a while. But he couldn't think of the right words either. So the word, music came first for Paul than the words. And the original words were going to be something like um, scrambled eggs, you know, baby, I love your legs. And, then, and he realized that it wouldn't work you know, for a proper song. But it was there just to get the rhythm. So I think that from my perspective, um, I mean, we can talk about the historical change and their political impact. And, but I'm trying to focus on the, you know, the way they had with the words. And um, I would say that from my perspective, each, each song, some, some I like better than others, but the vast majority are, I think are great. I think each song is a, is a literary masterpiece and a, 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 a rhetorical performance as well. Um, another aspect of their lyrics in particular is the ambiguity. And I know I drive some of my students crazy with this because they just want to you know, digest the song for its mere entertainment value or, or go for the easy message. But I think that that's being too dismissive and you have to rise to the challenge and see what's actually there. Uh, it's possible to overthink it and, and John often um, John didn't like school. He's, a I think, a brilliant artist, but he didn't like school. He felt confined by it. So he, on certain songs like um, I'm the Walrus, he purposely loaded in words there just to mess with his old English teacher back in the high school. <laughs> so I, I'm conscious of that you know, ability to see too much into it. But I think it's worth the challenge. I think it's a lot like poetry. Um, so I try to view each song as like a little intellectual puzzle. What, 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 does, what do we think it means, and what else might it mean, and how can we unravel it? And if it means contradictory things, so be it. I mean, the literature sometimes is like that. Um, I haven't done it this year, but in past years I've signed an essay by Mikhail Bakhtin, a Russian a literary theorist, and he gets into a dialogism where he talks about several principles that can be applied, like intertextuality and no uh, novelization and uh, carnival and chronotopes. And I, I won't bore you like a my regular students with the, the details of that, but it's a really you know, hardcore analysis. It was originally meant to apply to things like a Dostoevsky novel or a Tolstoy novel. So I think if literary critics are able to apply that to Beatles songs, it really does show some potential there. And of course, the irony, again, is the Beatles were humble guys. They, they came from very humble beginnings. As Professor Lyons pointed out, Liverpool was the, uh, is a big town, like a million people at the time, but it was not, not appreciated. You know, London was the place to be. So they, no one would expect uh, much of the Beatles. I mean, they were not college educated. They were not musically trained. Um, again, not Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare came from Stratford upon Avon, kind of the boondocks. Did not have a prestigious education or family background, and uh, wasn't the right social class, so to speak. So I think that that's I think the 
So the de democratic aspect of the Beatles' achievement is, is very impressive to me, too, that uh, living here in America, and wherever you might have come from, we're all here now, and we believe in, in the ability to rise up and, and achieve things, and I think they really embody that. I think that's why they did so well in America. Um, now, I focus mostly on the storytelling ability of the, of the band, you know, through their words, but I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, you know, their, their charm. I mean, they, they were funny. They knew how to hold a press conference. They were very comfortable in front of a camera. They, they were very photogenic. Uh, that's undeniable. Uh, you might not like their music. You might not want to you know, listen to the lyrics and try to parse them out. But there's a certain, you know, quality they had about them just visually that was very arresting, very impressive. Um, yeah, so charisma, I think, is a good word for it as well. Uh, the personalities are quite interesting, too, and we could spend hours on that. There have been hundreds of books written about their personalities and, and where they came from. Um, and as John alluded to, I think they had an impact on history, and I, I think Bill might get into that a little bit, too. They, they, they did change the world. I would argue in some ways that they had more impact than, than many politicians, because they raised people's consciousness, uh, first in England and even more so in America. And it's not a coincidence that this was an era of civil rights activity and um, you know, women's rights and things like that. People's consciousness uh, were raised, not entirely by the Beatles, they didn't do it single-handedly, but they were a big part of that. Music had this ability to reach people on an emotional level that made them think in a new way. And so I think in, in my final comments here, the, the Beatles, I think they transcend time. That's why we're still talking about them today. Again, like Shakespeare, certain things are just classic. They, they're produced in a certain era, but they go beyond that era. I think this is why I still have a lot of love and affection for songs by Elvis and Little Richard and Chuck Berry and the, the first generation rock and roll. But those guys are all kind of stuck in time, I think. They never quite got beyond the 1950s. It's, it's hard to think of them without the 1950s, and hard to think of the 1950s without them. You know, um, Elvis maybe is, is another person who lives forever, I guess, you know. But the other guys are kind of stuck in, in the past, and I think the Beatles will probably live forever. Uh, I mean, not physically, unfortunately, but um, the, the, the reputation and, and their, their, their legacy. And I do think that, that they have this ability to bring out the best in people that, that listen to them. So if you haven't tried it yet, to give them a listen. Right. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, coming today. Um, I thought I knew the Beatles pretty well. I've been um, following them most of my life, and um, I thought I knew just about everything. But um, from listening to Jim and John this morning, I've, I've added a lot to my um, Beatle knowledge, and thanks, guys, for that very much. A lot to think about. Um, so I'm um, uh, Jim and, um, and, and John are, are scholars, and um, I, I'm, um, I'm an extremist. I'm a partisan. I'm committed 100% to the Beatles, and um, I'm not always rational about it, um, and, and I don't always parse it correctly. But um, I, I'm totally committed to the Beatles and have been for a long time. Um, um, I, I, I turned to Beatle music um, years ago, and um, I, I've always turned to them in times of happiness or sorrow, and uh, times of uh, joy, and uh, times of stress or, or whatever it is. I've, 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 the Beatles have been there. There's always a Beatles song to accompany um, what's happening in my life. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, is anybody here from philosophy? I don't think I've seen any philosophy department of people, but um, um, uh, there's a famous uh, um, American philosopher, or, or maybe it's British, um, Whitehead. Do you guys know? Is he, is he British? I mean, anyways, Whitehead said that, um, he said, um, all philosophy, all philosophy is a footnote to Plato, and um, I think that's probably some truth to that. Um, I've kind of paraphrased that to um, all modern music is a footnote to the Beatles, and I, I think there's truth to that as well. Um, so here we are, uh, 60 years after the Beatles wrote um, uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and I'm thinking back in 1963, while the Beatles were writing 
um, I want to hold your hand. Joliet Junior College was in full swing. We had been around for 60 years or so. And I'm just wondering if back in October of 63 or any time that year, a group of students got together and um, reflected on some music from 1920 or 1918 uh, and, and talked about how it has impacted their life and how we're all still sharing it today. <laughs> There's none of that. And, and, and what, so I'm proposing that some of you will probably be around 40 years from now. Anybody going to be around 40 years from now? Because uh, I'm suggesting the, the next, or do it, we can do it more frequently than that, but certainly 40 years from now we should have a uh, 100th um, celebration of, of the Beatles because I think they'll still be very popular, in fact growing um, beyond um, uh, their, their popularity today. But I'm just thinking back in 1963, nobody was thinking about what happened in 1923 um, the way we are today. Um, so I'd like to give you some personal reflections um, on the Beatles. Um, I first want to, um, you know, people often say to me, what's your favorite Beatles song? And that's really just an impossible question. It's, it it's just can't possibly be answered. There's so many different uh, genres of Beatle music, so many different themes and all. But um, what I would say is, if, if somebody didn't know much about the Beatles and, and, and they said, can you tell me a few songs I could listen to that I would get, get a full flavor of the Beatles, uh, that one I'm prepared to, to deal with. Um, they may not be my favorite, but I think they're representative and, and all. So I think I would begin by saying, um, listen to um, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Um, that, that's what started all this. It, it shook America up dramatically. Um, uh, the song, it, 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 I'm not saying it's one of, it, it's their greatest song, but it certainly is what launched the Beatles, and so there's a special spot for that song. So I would be very familiar with I Want to Hold Your Hand and be able to whistle that and, and hum it um, uh, if you want to know about the Beatles. Um, secondly, I would, I, I would have some pairs of songs. I would say two songs that I think are really important are um, Let It Be, which is primarily a McCartney song, and um, In My Life, which is primarily a Lennon song. They're both very reflective about, uh, and, and you know, have some, some spirituality to them, some meaning to them and, in that sense. And so I, I would listen to those, and you know, great music as well. Um, I, would, I would listen to, um, I'm gonna just pick two here, um, Paperback Writer and um, uh, Day Tripper I would pick if you want to hear the Beatles really rock. I mean, I, I think those are two great songs where they really um, explode with, um, with rhythm and, and all. And then I, I have to include a George song. So for George, I would, um, it's kind of tough because there's a few there, but I, I would probably pick Here Comes the Sun on that. But I think if you listen to those songs, you'll get a pretty good overall picture of um, the Beatles. Um, I'd like to take you back to the um, fall of 1963 and introduce you to the Beatles the way I met them. Um, 1963 was um, a, a time of turmoil in the United States. Um, John Kennedy, you know, was assassinated in November of 1963. It, it shut the country down. It was like nothing we've experienced since. I mean, we've had 9-11 and other things, but the Kennedy assassination was the first time we had this kind of coming together as a nation to watch uh, a tragic event, and there were only three TV stations, and um, you know it was it was just a shocking thing. Kennedy was a young guy; he'd been just elected president at the age of uh, when he was elected. He, he was the youngest president ever elected at 43, or 43 when he took office, 42. I'm blanking out on that exactly, but he, he was a very young guy, and he was very athletic, and um, you know, just really, um, young people really uh, connected with him. And during the fall of 63, Kennedy was trying to get the 1963 Civil Rights Act through Congress. And I don't know if you know this, but up until 1964, it was legal to discriminate in, uh, by businesses in hiring based on race, religion, ethnic background, and gender. So it was perfectly okay to say, oh, I'm not, I don't hire women in my company, or I don't rent to Jews. That, that was legal. And Kennedy was trying to change that by getting the 63 Civil Rights Bill through Congress. And he got, um, he got uh, Martin Luther King to help on that. And you know, King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in August of 63. And so it was a time of, uh, great change coming in the United States and great optimism for the future. But then Kennedy was shot and things shut down. Um, the country went into kind of a depression, uh, a, a collective depression in the country. And um, 
you know, in, in polls taken right after the Kennedy assassination, you know, Kennedy won the election by 100,000 votes. That's far less than 1%. After the election in a survey, a after the assassination, 70% um, of Americans reported they had voted for John Kennedy a couple of years earlier when the result actually was about 49%. So Kennedy was, it was, it was a real uh, trauma. And, and people were kind of depressed. And then as Christmas came on, um, people started talking about this group from England is coming. And people didn't, Americans didn't know much about English music. And, um, and, and, uh, but these, these guys are coming and they got long hair. And th that's what you keep hearing. They've got long hair and they're coming and they're going to, um, they're, they're, it, it turned out to be the Beatles. And uh, so people, at that time, there were three radio stations in, uh, or, or there were, I'm sorry, three TV stations. There were two radio stations in Chicago that people listened to. If you listen to rock and roll music, there was WCFL and WLS. There were AM stations. You could only, this was going to shock some of you, you could really only listen to the radio if you were at home in your room or if you were in the car. And if you're in the car, if you were with your parents, you probably weren't listening to rock and roll music because they didn't listen to rock and roll. So you, there, was an there wasn't as much opportunity to listen to music as there is today where we're, we're just surrounded and you carry it with you everywhere you go. And, and so it was hard you know, to, to find the, this new song that was out this. I wonder. So finally, um, uh, people got to hear the song, I Want to Hear Your ha Hold Your Hand and started looking forward to the fact that Ed Sullivan, the, the Beatles were coming to Ed Sullivan. Now, you gotta understand something about Ed Sullivan, okay? Because there's nothing like Ed Sullivan's show today. Ed Sullivan was a show that on Sunday night from seven to eight o'clock, uh, you sat and, and uh, Jim or John talked about uh, jugglers and um, acrobats and things like that. It was a family show that you watched with your grandparents and your parents and your brothers and sisters on, on Sunday night. And there's no show like this that was, it was aimed at the family. And so you might watch if there was some kind of popular singer that that singer might be on. There'd always be a, a Broadway act, somebody from Broadway, because Ed Sullivan was in New York City. He had been a TV critic in the, night, in the early 50s, and he was always writing about how lousy American TV is. And somebody said, well, why don't you start your own show? And he said, all right, I will. So he started the Ed Sullivan Show. And that show was, uh, again, I, I don't think there's anything like this today where you would sit down with your grandparents, your parents, and your younger brothers and sisters and all watch the TV show the way Ed Sullivan was. So it was, it was really a significant thing. You know, we always hear, oh, the Beatles were on Sullivan, but not understanding what that was. It was, uh, the whole country was watching it. And those 70 million people included grandparents and parents and kids and everyone watched it. And so the, the Beatles came on. Now, the next day in grade schools, I know, and, and, and probably in high schools and stuff too, the next day after that show, life changed in America. It was a dramatic overnight change. All the girls were speaking in English accents. They acquired English accents overnight. And the boys, you're right, they didn't, they didn't start growing their hair long, because they were, but they started combing their hair down over, so guys that used to wear their hair kind of combed up were the next day all combing it down over their forehead to have bangs like the Beatles. And, and so it, it really changed um, uh, life. And then, so I, I won't go into all the um, st stages of the Beatles. I think Jim did a good job of doing the different stages. I, I, I agree with that. Um, but um, I want to, um, so I'm, I'm gonna just skip a little bit here. Um, so in 64, 65, 66, the Beatles kind of continued. Then they started changing with Rubber Soul came out in the fall of 65. Rubber Soul was a little more introspective and um, great music on there, but it was a different, it was very different. Um, you know, the Beatles' first songs were, 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 were very much lighter and, and all, but then they started getting reflective and, and John Lennon wrote the song um, Help, which um, was kind of the first song that really looked in, in the summer of 65, which was very um, introspective and talked about how he needed help and um, it was a change. And so the Beatles started becoming more introspective. In 1967, when they, lost, when they released Sgt. Pepper, that was another shockwave. That was the second time the Beatles kind of changed America because many people did not like it one bit, Sgt. Pepper. Sgt. Pepper was one thing. A, a different People have described it as you could no longer dance to the Beatles. 
because Sgt. Pepper wasn't dance music, uh, but it was um, songs like um, Lovely Rita and um, uh, When I'm 64, songs that were very different and, and, and uh, 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 it just kind of changed music in, entirely. So if you're somebody who's interested in the Beatles, you will see a switch there as you're listening to the early songs that are um, based upon I Love You, You Love Me, and then the Beatles uh, in, in Sgt. Pepper is a, a great change point. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the 1980s, um, I, well, I, I live in, in, on the south side of Chicago in the Beverly area, and I have some neighbors across the street um, who moved in, a, a Polish couple, um, Andy and Margaret, and we would often get together and we, we were talking and they shared with me their experience living in a communist country. They were living, you know, before the, the fall of, um, uh, before the Berlin Wall came down, they were living under communism. And what they did in, in the 60s, they, they told me how they and their friends would, because um, they knew I was a Beatles fan, so we would talk about this all the time, but they, they would tell me about how they would listen to Beatle music underground on underground radio that came in, and they would learn English that way. And Gorbachev has talked about this as well, how if you're sitting around singing songs like All You Need Is Love, and you're singing songs that the American kids are singing to, it becomes a little harder to hate each other and to plan the, the eventual destruction. So um, this is something, if, if you're interested, you could read a little more on your own, but I, I'm gonna go, this is part of my extremism, this is part of my, like, the Beatles are responsible for all goodness kind of thing. Um, uh, the Beatles helped in communism, and, and I, think, uh, I, I, I think there's, I think there's, I think that, um, there's, uh, and, and Dennis, I'd be happy to um, talk about this further with your debate or whatever, but the Beatles helped bring about the end of communism because of the fact that you, you, you don't hate people that you sing Beatles songs with, okay? You, you can't be planning their mutual destruction with, with people that you've sang Beatles songs with. And, and Andy, they, they, he brought, several times he brought friends in from, um, came in from Europe and, uh, uh, we had conversations on, on that as well. Um, I'm eliminating some things that John and um, Jim covered well. So, um, um, So um, John ended by um, quoting from John Lennon um, about um, uh, swim, swim, and you know John has a lot of great quotes. My favorite John Lennon quote is in um, his song that he wrote to his son, Sean, um, later after the Beatles broke up. He wrote the song, um, you know, about beautiful boy, and he says there, um, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. And I think that happens to a lot of us, you know, life, life goes on. So, so the Beatles said some very profound things. Um, uh, one thing I was going to mention to you is I'll also just reminded of something John said. John mentioned Jane Asher, who was um, Paul's girlfriend in the early 60s. And um, Jane um, uh, lived in London, and Paul actually moved into the family home, to the Asher home, and was staying there. And um, uh, Jane's brother was um, a guy named Peter Asher. Peter was part of a group called Peter and Gordon that mm -hmm. had several big hits, and they were written primarily by Paul, those hits. But um, about 15 years ago, Peter Asher, um, who who's, um, has a radio show, he has on, on the Beatle channel, and, and is, is kind of active in um, Beatle things, and um, he... Um, uh, played at the um, Old Town School of Folk Music, and uh, he, he had a band with him, and he sang Beatles songs and told stories. And as he was talking, he, he pulled out a um, yellow piece of paper, a legal pad, with some writing on it, and he put it up on the screen. 
and it was the handwritten notes of Paul McCartney to the song, um, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And um, what happened was he was telling the story about how on October 17th, 1963, Paul was over with John and they were down in the basement of the Asher home, sitting side by side at a piano, writing um, the song, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Mm. Making notes and crossing it out. And, um, so, and then Paul took the note and signed it and gave it to Peter. So. And so he was showing us that, and to me that was like, um, that was quite a moment to see the actual handwritten notes um, of, of, of Paul and John to, I want to hold your hand. And if I can tie that to Shakespeare a little bit, because I, I agree with Jim's um, tie of Shakespeare and the Beatles, um, probably, and, and I'm probably more committed and um, impressed by that whole thing than Jim, because I, I think the Beatles will rake up there with Shakespeare, it'll be Shakespeare and the Beatles. Um, but um, I'm thinking, um, what if somebody today had a handwritten note from Shakespeare where he's crossing out some things and he's got to be or crossed out, to be or not to be, and he comes up with it. And that would be the equivalent, to me, to me, that's the equivalent uh, of, of of Peter Asher having the John Lennon um, yeah. and Paul McCartney, I want to hold your hand notes. So um, this has been a great experience. Um, uh, enjoy the uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, and um, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so much. Can we please give our three presenters one more round of applause? We're now going to start our Q&A, so if anybody has a question. As a, as a, uh, um, a quick question is, and it's a simple one, but I guess John, you can answer this. Why did they go from one name of the band to the Beatles, and where did they get the name the Beatles? It's just, it's just like kind of a, that, why, why the Beatles? Why did they move to that name? Okay, yeah, the, the story is about the Beatles, is that uh, the band that they loved was uh, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Ah. And if you've ever heard them, they're, you know, Buddy Holly's a fantastic uh, songwriter, they loved that. And uh, so they wanted a name that was something similar to the Crickets. In other words, they wanted some sort of bug. And uh, they thought of the idea of calling themselves uh, Beatles, B-E-E. -E. But then, of course, uh, the music at that time even was known as beat music, and there was also a beat scene that was kind of literally seen, and so that's why they changed the spelling to B-E-A-T, to Beatles. So it's a combination of them. Uh, it's basically their the, the love of Buddy Holly and the Crickets, you know, but uh, that's it. I think we had a question. Oh, not a question, just a comment. I actually really liked your presentation. At first... I wasn't really much of a person wanting to listen to Beatles, and I'm not even going to lie, I thought to myself that it, they probably made some lame music or whatnot. <laughs> but then after hearing the presentation and how they had a big impact on us, I actually want to take some time to actually listen to some of these songs. Well, I'll do a quick advertisement here. If anybody wants to take my British history class, <laughs> I spend about 10 weeks on the Beatles. Oh so if you do want to take... Uh, Beatles class. Lovely. Well, I've got a comment back here. Uh, some of you know me. I'm Betty Zarsky. I've been around here since 1985 or so, and I was 10 when they did the Ed Sullivan show. I remember it well. And we had a lot of flashbacks during this hour here, so thank you guys very much. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, the other two presenters did talk a lot about the personal context of the Beatles. John, what, what, what is your first memory of the Beatles? Do you remember? Well, I'm far too young 
<laughs> obviously remember the Beatles but uh, no, for me they've always been there there was no sort of moment there's no Ed Sullivan moment there was no kind of particular moment I just they've always been there and like I say um, I think the thing about the Beatles music is that you know you can pick a lot of groups or artists and you can like 10 20 of their songs and then the others you skip over but I think what's remarkable about the Beatles is how many good songs they did. I mean, it's just incredible, really, that uh, they wrote so many. You listen to an album of theirs, and there's, there's very few songs that you want to really skip over because they are so good. So, uh, but yeah, there was no great one moment. I wouldn't say that. It's just something, they've always been there. I recognise their music, and I recognise the importance of them as well. So, I don't, uh, Jim, do you want to say something? Oh, um, yeah, like I said, it, it was sort of a slow process for me, and... Um, I think in my high school years, Michael Jackson and Madonna were, were bigger stars. And, but I come to think that Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney did uh, one or two team-ups, yeah. and yeah. that sort of got me interested, I suppose. But it really was a couple of years later where I really took a deep dive into the band. And, and I, I don't mean to you know, denigrate any other music either. There's, there's plenty of great musicians out there, but there's just something unique about the Beatles where they just seem to be at the top. And then like the, the Michael Jordan of, of rock and roll. <laughs> you know, it wasn't um, always initially obvious that the Beatles were going to rise to the top. Um, during the spring of 64, there was a group out of England called the Dave Clark Five, uh -huh. and a lot of radio stations tried to um, prompt um, uh, debates between who's the best, the Beatles or the Dave Clark Five. I thought it was a ridiculous debate because I knew the Beatles were obviously, but a lot of people were, oh, I like the Dave Clark Five, and they, the, I think a year later the Dave Clark Five were gone, but, but there was this thing that they tried to promote, um, a, a contest between the Beatles and the Dave Clark Five, and I don't think today the Dave Clark Five um, are of any influence. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Vicky, could you now tell us when did you become a big fan of the Beatles? <laughs> and what is your favourite Beatles song? Oh, I can never pick a favourite song, no. <laughs> I, I don't remember it, I don't remember exactly when I first heard the Beatles, but I do remember the first two songs that I really loved were Love Me Do and Eight Days a Week, and I would listen to them constantly. And then um, at, at some point, uh, I, my dad just gave me all of his old records uh, from when he was a kid, and that was like the first time that I had re records of my own that I could listen to constantly and Revolver was in there. This really like, it, it, I still have it, it's just, it's really like unfortunate beating up copy of Revolver, but I listen to it constantly. So <laughs> that was like the first album of theirs that I would listen to all the time. And I love all of them, but yeah, Revolver special for that reason. Yeah, I was going to say pretty obviously that, you know, about young people today, the remarkable thing is that a lot of them like the same music that their parents or even grandparents like. You know, while I'm sure for us, when we were teenagers, the last thing you'd want to do is like the same music as your parents. <laughs> you know, that was exactly what you did want to like. So I think that's what's kind of remarkable now, that you can actually like people from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and modern music as well. You know, the, the, yeah. it's all there. It's all available to us. So, yeah, but so I don't know if anybody else wants to tell us what their favourite song is or whatever. Uh, do you, Amy, do you want to... Well, I could say my favorite song is In My Life, and um, I first heard it actually in the Wonder Years, oh. so um, I was uh, probably like 12 years old, and I hadn't, I'd probably heard Beatles songs, but didn't really know that it was a Beatles song I was hearing, and um, I just absolutely fell in love with that song, and it's become just one of my most favorite songs in the whole world, so definitely that, and then also, around the same age, Ferris Bueller's Day Off came out, oh, yeah. and there's the famous uh, you know parade scene there yeah. and they dance to twist and shout so that was another one that I was like oh my gosh what is this song so I think that actually became a hit yeah. in the US didn't it after that movie yeah. came out yeah. I think they re-released the single yeah. it was that yeah. important yeah, Dennis right. yeah. love it what's that right. favorite songs when you like the Beatles actually I twist, twist and shout that's the one I like most mm -hmm. and you yeah. said it Amy I, that's the song because of what you just said I, Fierce <laughs> Miller came out my senior year of high school, and that, that's all they stayed with me. So, Jimmy and I, I don't know what Jimmy and I are the same age, but it's Twist and Sound. By, by, as a matter of fact, by far. I just think that's a great song. I think it's uh, it's not an intellectual song necessarily, but it's also. I should, I should say that if you know the song, 
It's, it's funny, so many people pick it, and it yeah. wasn't even actually written by the Beatles. Yeah. It was written by the A. Isley Brothers. Yeah. Well, it became famous by the A. Isley Brothers. Did. Yeah. Too. yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's so associated with the Beatles, yeah. isn't it? Right, right, yeah. I think yesterday was a song that um, helped win a lot of people over to the Beatles. Yeah. Um, it was a song because a lot of parents and a lot of people were saying, oh, these Beatles are, um, you know, they're just a flash and they'll be gone in six months and, and all that. But um, when yesterday came along, it was obviously a, a very serious, very substantial song. And I think a lot of people started to realize the Beatles, it, it's what woke a lot of people up to the, the Beatles are here to stay. Oh, well, one of my favorites was uh, And I Love Her, but I actually had a question for you guys. Uh, do you have any opinion of the movie Across the Universe? Like, did you agree with the plot, how they put the songs in, um, how they read the characters and everything? I, I, I could probably answer that a little bit. Um, there was a film from around 2006 or 2007 uh, by Julie Taymor, who actually has done a lot of Shakespeare productions as well as a like a Broadway director, and she um, constructed a plot around Beatles songs. Uh, to, it takes place in the 1960s. Um, I haven't seen the movie in a while, but I thought it was very well done. And for something I was kind of thinking about it in a different way, which is that those were cover versions. In some ways, they were really you know, dramatic reinterpretations of what the Beatles had done themselves. Um, and that movie was not the first to produce covers of the Beatles songs. I mean, they, that's one of the ways they have sort of ensured their longevity, is that other artists continue to re-record the Beatles songs in different ways. And I've heard rap versions, blues versions, country western versions, jazz versions, um, reggae versions. I mean, the, the Beatles are like infinitely adaptable. And I think that just shows their, their staying power. Yeah. So, but I think the film is very clever visually and, and, and um, musically too. Any other comments? Oh, yeah. Okay, my name is Katie Bond. I'm library secretary. Hello, everybody. Gosh, I feel like that Bridesmaids movie, <laughs> when that girl was like, hi, everyone, welcome. Anyway, I have a question for you that has just been killing me. Um, I saw a Netflix special about the Paul McCartney conspiracy. What are your thoughts on that? I'm dying to know. Because I really think that the Paul McCartney Alive today is a fake. <laughs> what do you guys think? T talk about the story. What do you think? Have you seen that? I think it was either Netflix or uh, where Paul McCartney really died and... You know, in, in um, I think it was about 1969, um, people uh, rumors started spreading that Paul had been killed in a car accident and they had had a replacement for him. Um, I, I really, I, I really think that the Paul before 1969 and after 1969 was the same guy, and it'd be very difficult to duplicate that. But, but what happened was there were little clues planted in, in Beatles songs. So if you played a song backwards, it would say, "Turn me on, dead man," or another one would, it would say, um, "I buried Paul," and and then there were. There were songs. It was the the, the famous um, in in um, Abbey Road. There's this famous um, uh, sequence of songs where where they talk about um, um, pick up the backs, get in the limousine, so we'll be away from here. Um, and that was the idea of, of a funeral. Paul, pick up the backs, or, or that something to do with the, 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 with, with the, the limousine. And so all, all these little clues were were planted and. Um, and later on, John actually talked about it in interviews and stuff and joked about it. Um, but um, I, I don't think there's a lot of, um, 
I, I, actually, you should be relieved because Paul's not dead. Yeah. Paul's alive. It's still Paul. So, so it's a good thing to learn. I don't mean to disappoint you because I think it, the, the, good, the good news is Paul's alive. <laughs> Oh, that, that was, th this was all taking place in the late 60s, um, uh, when they were still together as a group. And, and, uh, in fact, the, the, to, to even get more detail on it, um, you know, there's the, um, there's the song um, that Ringo sings, but John, uh, John and Paul's song, um, A Little Help From My Friends, and um, Paul in, in, in Sergeant Pepper by saying, um, so let me introduce to you the one and only Billy Shears. And the rumor was Billy Shears was the singer who replaced Paul um, in, in the group. And um, so Thank you. it was great fun. But yeah. I would just say I, it, it's very interesting, and we live in you know, interesting times. And there are, I think, some conspiracies that are more valid than others, but n not this one. I, I think it would be. In, in, Virtually impossible to, to duplicate you know, Paul's look and, and sound and, and, uh, and all that. Although there is one way to potentially disprove it, which is uh, that he has a brother named Michael McCartney, and you could do a DNA test. That's my thought. No. <laughs> no, I mean, it's amazing that they found another Paul McCartney, and he was a great songwriter as well. I mean, it's just amazing that there's two of them around there. So. Yeah, and still talking. Thank you everyone for being here. We're going to take about five minutes to set up for our open mic and um, our listening party. So if you're available to stay, I encourage you to do so. We have our very own Steve Becker here who's going to play some Beatles songs on his guitar. And um, anyone else who wants to perform, we're also, um, I have a list of favorite songs, so um, after Steve performs, we'll be playing those as well. There is plenty of food here, so please help yourselves. Thank you all for coming out. It's been great to see everyone and again thank you to our amazing presenters. I'm Steve. Uh, I work here at the library's full-time access service clerk and I'm a big fan of the Beatles. I've been listening to them since I was five years old. My parents, they uh, owned a bunch of Beatles records so I just grew up with them. And when I started getting interested in music and wanted to play music, um, they were one of the first artists I really was interested in playing because they wrote their own music. Um, in those days, the music, they didn't do auto-tune or, you know, really any computers. It was just the band playing. So just as a musician, it's always more impressive to hear guitar players, singers, songwriters just doing it on their own without any other accompaniment. Um, my two favorite Beatles are George Harrison and John Lennon, so I'm going to do uh, some songs from them. Yeah. 
my love anymore That's when it hurt me And feeling like this I just can't go on anymore Please remember how I feel about you Thank you.